This is a presentation about people. It's about people working together with their communities to solve water quality problems. The presentation covers two aspects of this. One, it's about building community capacity, understanding what that means, how do we assess that. But the other part of this is that how do we bring the, the science of studying people, social psychology, sociology, applied natural resource social science, to bear on watershed problems. The rest of this presentation is going to talk about the evolving science of watershed planning, specifically about understanding the social context. This has been something that we're seeing evolve. The changes in approach to watershed planning are something that I've seen across the state of Wisconsin, but we're seeing across the country, re-emphasizing the networks for community change related to water quality, understanding how those networks work and how people work together seems to be one of those keys to long-term success for watershed planning. I'm Aaron Thompson. I'm an assistant professor of natural resource planning at UW-Stevens Point, and I also serve as a statewide extension specialist uh, focusing on using applied social science to help inform community capacity building. Throughout this work I get you know, the joy of interacting with a number of different communities that are actively working on solving local resource management challenges, providing planning and social science support for these efforts. I want to begin by defining planning for you. In my mind, planning is really two related components. The first of these is the active decision-making component. It's really how communities make public decisions. How do we define the problem? How do we want to solve that problem? But it's also a community dialogue, an opportunity for us to engage one another in these, in these discussions. And that's an important aspect of how do we build the coalitions, the capacity for long-term success. So why is it time to leverage social science as part of watershed planning efforts? A 30 second look on Google, typing in the search terms Wisconsin, conflict, and water quality jump out for me. As I flip through news stories, we come across this time and time again. We have competing interests, we have different priorities, things are changing, how society responds to water quality challenges is something we need to understand. And the same question, why is it time to leverage social science? Because we have problems that need to be solved. Communities are facing real challenges, again, blue-green algae issues, how we spend limited conservation dollars. These are all things that communities are working through, and social science can help support these efforts. As we'll explore kind of throughout the rest of the presentation, you'll see that social science can help us answer a lot of really complex uh, questions related to how do we develop watershed plans. But much of this begins with some of these simple questions. What is it we're trying to achieve? So in the context of the agricultural landscape, this question comes up time and time again. And over the last decade of my life, I've spent a lot of time focused in on this. What does it take to get adoption of conservation practices on the ground? It's complex. It involves economics, but it also involves attitudes and base values. right? And so some of these questions that come up is that what are we trying to achieve? What is it we're trying to get people to adopt? These go hand in hand. But we often lack an understanding of what people are doing now or what practices they'd be willing to do in the future. These become critical questions that can inform our outreach efforts. Why would we continue to pursue a practice that has limited or no possibility of support from the landowners that we're trying to get to adopt it? And then the really interesting social science questions. What influences that willingness? What are the critical variables that we need to understand? Those key attitudinal dimensions, the key economic dimensions, what is it that's driving these behaviors? How do we bring this together so that we can actually come up with some solutions to these applied problems? One of the challenges we often get into is that are we even asking the right question? For several decades we've asked about farmer adoption of conservation behaviors while often ignoring the fact that this is really a maintenance problem. Economics can help us understand you know, what will get someone to adopt a behavior. If we bribe them enough, it's amazing how many people will adopt. But, flip this around, what does long-term maintenance look like? Who are those producers that continue to use these practices well into the future? We're looking at a watershed plan. We have a 20 to 30 year time span that we're really trying to plan for. 
are we looking at practices that are only in place for a few years and won't have any impact on that long-term uh, water quality outcome that we're all after? I want to step back just for a minute and talk about where this all comes from. So from my perspective as a natural resource social scientist, my work is informed by a number of different disciplines. It comes from regional planning, social psychology, and sociology, but all of these are integrated into applied natural resource management. So I'm going to introduce you to the concepts that come from each one of these disciplines. So let's begin with planning. From a planning perspective, it's about making public decisions, but we know that this is a complex process. The quote that I've got on the screen here is that collaborative planning is an approach to solving complex problems in which a diverse group of autonomous stakeholders deliberate to build consensus and develop networks for translating consensus into results. This emphasis on turning consensus into results is reflected in the diagram that's here. The acceptance of long-term outcomes from a planning process is really made up of or composed of a community's ability to come together and have a conversation, so the civic engagement component. It's about identifying a common definition of the problem you're trying to, to solve. This is about consensus. And lastly, it's about the capacity to collaborate. Does a community have the skills to work together? Not just to arrive at, here's the problem, but to come up with a solution and then to see that solution implemented. Moving into social psychology. This is really about understanding factors that drive individual behaviors. And so we have to look to theory. Where's the foundation that we start to understand how people behave within the planning process? How do we start to understand what influences conservation practice adoption? Again, social psychology can help us understand this. The theory of planned behavior posits that attitudes, subjective norms, and perceived behavioral control are all part of this process. However, often in natural resource management, my conversations begin with something along the lines of, well, we need to change the behavior of this group. So I think we're going to try the targeted outreach or a farmer-led council, right? We need better information. We need to understand what is the right approach? How does that fit with the audience that we're trying to get to adopt this practice or participate in our effort? And lastly, it comes to sociology, and this is about community behaviors. So I can take all those individual behaviors we just talked about, the values, the attitudes, the behavioral beliefs, the norms, all of these things that an individual considers in their behavior. But ultimately, sociology teaches us that it's about trust and consensus. And how does that lead to the collective power to implement uh, our decisions? Right? Moving from individual actions to community actions is important. As one of my colleagues at UW Stout, Nels Paulson, uh, wrote me in an email, he said, social change and civic engagement goes beyond just trying to change an individual's behavior. The community has to change first or at least simultaneously with the individual land user. I think this encapsulates the contribution of sociology quite well to watershed problems. Building off of all of these other disciplines, natural resource social science is an applied science. And what this means is that we're trying to build on our understanding of individual community behavior and how communities make public decisions and apply these to natural resource problems like water quality. It is an evolving science. And what I mean by an evolving science is that we are, we're learning more uh, all the time about how we can better apply theory, methods, and techniques uh, to understand these problems and help support community efforts uh, to engage in watershed planning. Sometimes it gets confused with the I love my lake surveys. Right? And so these are civic engagement tools where we hand out a questionnaire uh, at a public meeting to get people to, to just kind of give us some feedback about what they think about their lake. But let's not confuse the two. What we're doing here is really, it's, it is a science, and it requires scientific data collection. This work is always driven by research questions and funding availability, and it's at its best when it's an integrated part of an existing planning process just in the same way that we'd want to integrate the biological, physical, and chemical uh, analysis of a watershed, we want to bring social science into that uh, planning process to help a community make decisions.
And it's not always about surveys. This is one of those things as a social scientist that does work around the state with different communities, people jump back to this time and time again. To be honest, it's about applying the best set of methods, the best set of, you know, the best science available to try and answer the question that's in front of us. This last winter, I had the opportunity to help support uh, the community in the lower Fox Basin up by Green Bay as they're working through some of the challenges of how do you engage the agricultural community in a conversation about the future, about managing for water quality, about working together, about conservation and yield, uh, and answering these questions you know, related to how do we get this done. We began this as just a simple discussion, as a summit that brought farmers together to have this conversation, to put them in a place to have, uh, to be able to ask the questions. And we emerged from this with some simple answers about, you know, who is it that they want, look to for information? What is it that they need? And then how do we share information with one another? Again, as the beginning point of a process, we can collect this data, uh, build consensus and understanding of this community and what they need to participate in watershed planning. When I talk about community capacity building, what I'm really asking here are, are local partners ready to accept responsibility? Are they willing to take ownership of the problem? Because long-term success requires that. I often look at this with my students and we talk about public participation kind of as a three phase, right? From a planner's perspective, public participation is a good idea. You'll see this come up over and over again in the literature. This is something, yeah, it's good. We're going to make a decision. It's good to have an opportunity for people to come out and talk to you and give their input. Going beyond that, we often see that public participation is absolutely necessary. Having the community directly engaged and involved in the process can prevent the things from going off the tracks later on. But it's really more than that, and this is that appreciation that we're trying to build into watershed planning. Is that it's about public ownership of the problem. It's not just about getting through the 12 months while we're writing the watershed plan or working our way through studies that take two or three years. It's about the 20 years beyond that. How does a community come together around these problems? It's about how do they own that, how do they carry it forward, and how do they invite us as experts in to help support their efforts. And community capacity building often forces us to ask some critical questions. Does our community have the capacity to work together toward a common goal? Do we really know our stakeholders? And this means, do we understand what they will and won't support? And lastly, how do we work towards consensus with our partners and how do we communicate water quality solutions? These are all critical questions that social science can help us understand. Capacity analysis is really a process of understanding the strengths and weaknesses of an organization. Strengths are just simply things, you know, conditions, people, resources that give a group uh, an advantage. They're more likely to succeed. Whereas weaknesses are obviously the opposite of that. As we look at May Davenport's model about collaborative planning and sustainable watershed management, May starts with the individual. Well, what can an individual accomplish? Well, an individual with support, regulations, education, technical assistance, financial incentives, can do something, but they're not going to solve a watershed's problem all by themselves. This takes building relationships. Within those relationships, building trust, legitimacy, and fairness and ultimately growing programmatic and organizational capacity skills alongside these. So just to explore May's model a little bit further, I look at this as that if we're trying to understand capacity or analyze capacity, what are these pieces that we need to look at? So relational capacity, it's really about understanding the relationships between people, but also identify community organizing, right? Where that's occurring, where it's not occurring. It's about building trust, is there a transparent process? Is there representation from a diverse group of stakeholders? And are there those beginnings or that effort to collaboratively plan, identify problems, build skills? Those things have to be part of this. But it's also about the governance component, how we make those decisions. And so organizational capacity looks at conflict management and strategic partnering. Programmatic capacity looks to coordination are we reaching outside of our watershed to resources at the state, regional, and within the local level as well? Are we constantly looking at what we're doing, evaluating, and adapting, and learning from that? 
But these two components, the social and economic profile that looks at relationships and network capacity, um, and the governance profile that looks at these characteristics around organizational and programmatic capacity, these are important parts of this puzzle. So as we begin to develop a social inventory to support watershed planning, one of those key components uh, in this analysis of capacity model is starting to look at the social and economic profile of a community. These ask some critical questions. These go back to that, what do stakeholders want? What will they support? These are the types of things that we need to understand. So as an example of a social profile or a stakeholder profile, I wanted to go ahead and introduce some of the work that I've done in the Wausau area. Working with a group of local citizens there, we were trying to understand the community's attitudes towards Lake Wausau, which is an impoundment on the Wisconsin River. But it's an urban reservoir, completely surrounded by urban, or by urban communities, some small, some large, um, but all benefiting in some way or receiving some of the, you know, dealing with some of the challenges with this lake. We look to the community. Can we conduct a community-wide survey to understand if the priorities of those citizens who are in the room, that are engaged in the process, are those the same priorities that are held by the community at large when we look outside of the room? This became an important question, this motivation. What is it that's motivating the community to protect water quality in Lake Wausau? And what I found using a, a survey approach, it's called an inverted R, uh, analysis technique is that we can identify both the differences and then in a minute I'll talk about some of the similarities amongst the community members here. What the process revealed for us is that related to how people view Lake Wausau there were four distinct uh, belief systems uh, so ways that people look at and engage with this resource. One of these we've described as the tradition these are people that feel at home on Lake Wausau, right? This is, a, this is a place that's part of their family tradition to come back here time and time again and spend time. There's a group that looks at this as an industrial resource. Again, the Wisconsin River, the moniker, it's the hardest working river in America, isn't dead and gone. And we're seeing that emerge here. Group three, this is a group that actively recreates on water, but they choose to do so elsewhere because of competition with other users, so crowding, interference, um, but also because of poor water quality. They don't trust eating the fish out of the resource, right? You know, out of the lake. That, these are things that are motivating them to leave their community and go use a water resource elsewhere. And then lastly, there's a, a fourth group that I just briefly want to mention as well. This group feels that the, the water is so dirty that they don't even feel safe touching it. Understanding that the community is differently motivated is important. But we can also start to dig into this and understand that overwhelmingly, you know, the largest majority of these people fall into that tradition. They match those views of the people that are engaged in the planning process. And that's good. That shows that there's support. But it's not uniform. And it's not like it's an overwhelming majority of people feel one way about this resource. And so it's going to take multiple approaches. How do we engage people across the spectrum? And I'm going to jump into where the community agreed, so where we found consensus in the Lake Wausau community. But before I do, I just want to acknowledge this, is that the process of, of looking for consensus is about identifying common interests. So those beliefs that are widely shared within a community and that are perceived to benefit the whole community. These are places we can build a community conversation from. So where the Lake Wausau community agreed. And again, these are responses that across all of the people who responded to the survey, these were things that they all agreed on. They strongly agreed that Lake Wausau adds to the beauty of their community. They believe that community members need to take an active role in the future of this resource. They also agreed that Lake Wausau contributes to the community's ability to attract new residents and employers. And lastly, they agree that local funding to revitalize this lake is a good investment in the future. And what we've seen emerge from the conversations and the follow-up and the, the planning process emerging around this resource is that number three and number four become really critical. They're interconnected. We needed an 
in this community's case, one of the recognized other priorities in the community is economic development, attracting businesses, but also being able to attract and retain good employees. How can Lake Wausau and its future contribute to that discussion? Beyond just the social profile, we can also develop a governance profile. What this means is that we need to understand how decisions will be made. Whether or not these decisions will be representative of the community as a whole. Who are the governing bodies that will ultimately be responsible for implementing these plans? Social science can help us identify the need for alternative decision-making processes when our traditional local decision-making processes won't work for our natural resource management we're studying. This is really critically important when we're working with a diverse set of stakeholders that don't have a natural overlap. Perhaps we're working across county boundaries or working in ways that we haven't worked before and so there's no established formal decision-making process to follow. Social science can help us build a process to respond to that. Combining together what can be learned from stakeholder profiles and governance profiles within a watershed can help us understand capacity issues and allows us to identify issues that will have the support of the community, be realistic about what can and can't be accomplished, and also it can help us look to where the money is going to come from. This is about long term, you know, we're trying to look at implementation. It's great to have ideas, but we want these ideas to actually get on the ground. And so it can help us incorporate potential funding sources early on in the process. So how can social science and capacity analysis help support watershed planning? Well, the type of research that we're doing helps us, un helps us answer a number of critical questions. It can help us select or prioritize watersheds. Let's identify the high capacity watersheds. Let's identify pockets of willing landowners. Where, where are those places that we're most likely to succeed? It can help us design outreach strategies that respond to the social context in a particular watershed. Right? Responding to the priorities, the values, the needs of the people who live there is a critical part of uh, developing effective outreach strategies. It can also help us identify and understand stakeholder positions. This is really important, especially because sometimes we, we leave out stakeholders. We miss people, right? And the impact of that on our process can be fairly devastating. We can also understand within this how widely supported the views of different stakeholder groups are within a community. And this speaks back to that question of legitimacy. Is there legitimate representation from a diverse group of stakeholders? That's one of those keys to success for collaborative planning. It can also help us identify barriers to civic engagement, to adoption of conservation practices, to willingness to participate in our efforts and support the work that we're doing. These are the reasons that we're doing applied social science research. And it's also critical to acknowledge that watershed planning is a process. It's something that occurs over time. Different groups are at different stages. Right? They have starting and stopping points, and our information needs change. This is why engaging with a social scientist, bringing them into the process to help us explore these challenges in a watershed is critically important as well. We need to understand what are the right questions. You know, With the limited amount of funding we have to do the research, we need to make sure that we're asking the right question at the right time of the right group of people so that we can inform our work moving forward. I'm going to end with three slides that kind of hit on some of the highlights, the areas of critical research that are going on to help have social science help inform watershed planning. One of those is in developing our vision and selecting goals for a watershed plan. Right? We, we know from a collaborative planning perspective that it's important that the process is goal focused. So what can social science do here? Well again, this gets back to that. We're trying to develop networks for translating consensus into results. And it's about meeting stakeholders where they're at. Social science can help us understand how broadly supported different goals are in the community. Where are you going to find traction and, and pockets of other people within the community that will come and help support this work moving forward? The issue is, is that a community needs to decide first on what's important in order to work towards those goals. And if we don't know what's important to them, 
and we move down the path towards working on multiple other goals and we ignore the one that's absolutely most important, the community's not going to step in line with the plan and the plan will likely end up on a shelf. Just as a quick introduction here, we've been doing some of this work in the Big O Plain uh, in Marathon County uh, here in central Wisconsin. And one of the things that came out of the survey work was this very laser-like focus. The number one issue for all riparian st stakeholder groups is that developing a vision for the Big O Plain re requires acknowledging that minimizing the threat of winter fish kills is key to building lasting support among riparian landowners. If we don't take on this issue, if it's not the over if it's not the leading issue in the plan if it's not the leading issue that's being discussed if there isn't some kind of action the community can take to move forward on this issue then we've lost them we also know from collaborative planning that decisions must be community driven we often bemoan the lack of implementation success in watershed plans it's something that we as planners do we you know the, our worst fear is having a plan end up on a shelf, right? We went through a process with the community, and what I mean by putting it on the shelf is that, you know, you know, it sits there and collects dust, that nobody's using it actively, using it to improve the situation on the ground. Well, one of the reasons that we struggle with this is that our planning process is both trying to simultaneously educate stakeholders and asking them to make decisions. And the result is that we either oversimplify or overwhelm people. We don't spend enough time on tough decisions and necessary negotiation. And this speaks back to that notion of governance. How are decisions going to be made? Right? We need to, again, meet people where they're at, understand what they need in order to actually work to a place. And it may take a lot of co-learning, a lot of working together, of understanding the problem and working through the basics to get to a place that a community is ready to make some of these decisions. But that's where our effort can be invested. What social science can do here is, is that it can help us understand those approaches that, you know, the different approaches that it will take that a community would support to work towards that solution. Again, community ownership of the process equals local solutions for the problem. And I'll end here talking about behavior change. We all want to do this, but let's just acknowledge right out the gate that this is complex and it takes a long-term commitment. It's also from a research perspective is a huge commitment of resources to look at behavior change. But it takes digging back in. This is where we can borrow from our theoretical backgrounds from social psychology. We can start to ask the critical questions. We can look to local experts and key informants. We can bring together a process that can help us understand what are these what are the factors that are preventing people from taking part in these are they attitude based is there a lack of support is it community based is it how people view the community norms so the way that their view, neighbors would view their actions if they were to take a conservation or take on a conservation behavior is it about behavioral control which is a perception of how capable they are to do this this is part of this discussion as well and so these factors have to be considered as we're starting to look into this a good social science study is going to begin with what is the outcome we're trying to achieve and it's going to work its way backwards to what is the information that we need to achieve or we need in order to develop a strategy that's going to work And I'll leave here, which is, I appreciated the opportunity to share some of this information. I hope you can tell how passionate I am about bringing social science in to support these efforts. I began this presentation with this is a people problem, right? This is a conversation about how people and communities work together to solve wa local water quality challenges. Hopefully we can be able to bring the best science possible to bear on these problems and we can help inform and improve on the uh, implementation success of these efforts. Again, not being here in person, feel free to contact me if you have further questions. Again, thank you.